cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for joining. And uh, today, I will, as Bob just said, I will really give you a bit of a more of a, a deep uh, a deep dive on uh, basically how VB8 works under the hood, uh, what its architecture is, but also what our roadmap is, and, and also focus on the whole aspect of cloud native uh, a bit more. So why do we do such a deep dive meetup? Um, so as I just said, this is really going to be about more sort of and looking at the inside of VB8. Uh, if you haven't heard of VB8 yet or if you haven't used it yet, um, just to let you know, there's also a new introduction video out that Bob recorded, I think, uh, one or two days ago, and that just went live. And it basically shows you all of the things that you can do with uh, VB8 in like a 10-minute introduction. Uh, for today, I'm going to assume that you have a very rough understanding of what VB8 is so that I can um, tell you basically how it works and how it works under the hood. So why do we do this? Uh, first up, this has basically been based on, on your feedback, so based on community feedback. And there's been very positive feedback. Um, we've heard people say that while the architecture is one of the reasons of why I want to use VB8, or maybe they've even used something else before, but said that nah, doesn't maybe isn't compatible uh, with uh, what they expect for from a search engine uh, architecture-wise. So that's very good for us to hear. But there were also critical voices that said, well, you aren't very open about the architecture. You should highlight it a bit more or maybe explain the architecture a bit more. So basically, this is us being vocal <laughs> about the architecture and highlighting what's going on under the hood so that you don't have to read the, the code to get an understanding. Uh, another thing is just overall sort of, if you look at the ML and LP field, uh, NLP field um, and, and if you look at this sort of research versus production thing, a lot of projects are in a very, very early stage where basically um, the teams at the company, at large enterprise companies, every large enterprise company needs to have at least one uh, a team focusing um, on ML stuff and NLP stuff. Um, but a lot of these projects aren't in production yet. There's maybe a bit of research going here, and, and maybe it's because the business has other priorities, or maybe because the, the, the quality of those NLP tools, maybe they're not good enough yet. But another part of that is also because getting stuff to production is very, very hard. There's a lot of things that are currently or, or that that suddenly get introduced when you want to move to production that simply aren't the case if you're just doing sort of a, a spike or a discovery uh, uh, with some stuff locally. So basically, you can't just take a Jupyter notebook and put it into production. And, and even if you could, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> but uh, the good thing is that there are solutions such as VB8 that really are meant for production. So basically, what I want to convey today is that if you have those production requirements, which can mean large scale, it could mean that you need redundancy, fault tolerance, it could mean that you have specific security uh, uh, requirements, that you want your stuff to be observable, then that is really what VV8 is meant for. And also by being open about sort of how we achieve all of that and giving you a bit more insight, I also want to convey that basically the people behind VV8, that they make conscious decisions and that while we do sort of what we do, that we really also know what we're talking about. So it gives you a bit of trust in us as a team building a solution that's meant for production. So uh, this is a graphic that I just tweeted out. Maybe some of you have, have seen it um, yesterday. And basically, this is a very simple benchmark of uh, importing a specific data set into VB8. And uh, I will sort of tie this into our current architecture roadmap uh, of where we are and what's been happening. But the main takeaway for this at this point is basically just we've been improving things and things have been going going faster. <laughs> and basically, as you can see on this uh, roadmap, sort of each new version reduced the time that it took to import a data set into VB8. And um, yeah, you'll see in a second how that ties into our architectural roadmap. So before we get to the roadmap itself, I also want to talk about how data is stored in VB8, sort of at a very, very rough aspect, like the 30,000 feet view, just to, to show you sort of what happens in VB8 uh, when something gets stored. And uh, an important thing or an important distinction um, between VB8 as a vector search engine and as a database, if you compare it to, for example, just a a, a and n library, VB8 really as a as a uh, yeah as a database it returns the entire object and this object can be on disk and not just maybe a reference to that object not just an ID um, but not just that you can also combine the vector search itself with a, a structured filter so we call that scalar search so for an example you could say well give me all the users that are close to this specific user which would be the vector search part sort of the, the fuzzy part uh, in the vector space 
but only if the account balance of that user is, in this example, less than or equal to 2,000. And basically, we can do that efficiently and not um, sort of, uh, what, what we want to do is basically do this sort of uh, pre-filter uh, uh, where we say like, okay, first, we want to know what those users are and then limit the vector search to those users. Because if you do it the other way around, if you do a post filter, then you first do your vector search. Um, but then maybe none of the results that were returned in that limited search, maybe none of those match the, the uh, filter. So basically, we want to do this pre-filtered, or we do do this pre-filtered. And also, because it's a database, any mutation that you do, so any import, anything that you do in, in VV8, by the time that we have returned, or by the time VV8 has returned a successful status code to you, you can be sure that that data is written somewhere on disk. So it basically gives you the right guarantees that you get uh, from a database, as opposed to, I don't know, like a library that would only run in memory, for example. And as a result, this means that um, when we store data per index, so what you see here is basically one index that we have per class. And we'll, we'll see this graphic a few times more today. Um, Generally, there are three parts. There's a vector index. Uh, right now, the vector index that we support is HMSW. So that's um, sort of a very common index. Uh, suits our, our purpose very well because it allows mutability. It's, it's sort of relatively easy to customize. But also, because we serve the object, we need to store the object. So that's the object storage. And we need to build up this inverted index. So that's basically what allows us to do these uh, pre-filters that we can then combine with a vector index. So essentially, these are the three things uh, that we store. So what you see here is an overview of uh, our roadmap. And the cool thing about this is, um, other than the nice visualizations that we have, <laughs> the cool thing about this is that we're not starting at step zero right now. So basically, um, yeah, you've seen the the uh, the graphic with the import times that we're going down. Um, we're already so this is already going on. So some things are already co uh, complete, and other things are basically in development right now. Oh, sorry, that was that was too quick. So here, if we start uh, with step one, so step one, the first thing that we we did, and this was also triggered a bit by community feedback. So um, a few, what was it? I don't know, about two or three months ago, I think. Um, we were uh, trending on GitHub for, for a couple of days, and a lot of new users came into VB8, and that was really cool. It was sort of the, the first time that we got a lot of feedback. Like, of course, people had discovered VB8 before already, but that was the first time that we got a lot of users in, and they were able to give us sort of feedback, very different feedback on very different parts, some on the documentation, some on, on the implementation. And uh, one of the things was basically, uh, one of the, the feedback points that we got was basically, hey, this is HNSW, that's pretty cool. But I noticed that if I import a large data set, it's kind of slow. Like it doesn't, it doesn't get the kind of performance that I would expect from HNSW. And then um, we sort of took that feedback seriously and compared and saw that okay, yeah, that this is true. Like it's it's fast-ish, but it's not as fast as maybe HNSW could be. Uh, so basically, the first step that we said on this this sort of the the end goal of the roadmap is just scaling in general. And as you'll see later, scaling includes horizontal scaling. But scaling in general for us also just means being able to, to work with larger data sets. Like, obviously, we're in the space of, of big data. So we need to be able to, to handle large data sets. And one part of being able to handle large data sets is if we're building this sort of expensive uh, vector index at import time, it just means we need to do it fast enough. So um, the first step was basically optimizing uh, the HNSW index implementation. This was mostly fixing a few bugs here and there, just general performance optimization. VV8 is written in Go, so there are a couple of things that we could do. Um, and also, uh, one thing that, that I find <laughs> particularly cool is sort of we have one uh, assembly file right now in our implementation uh, where uh, the, the dot product calculation that we use, um, that we also use for, for cosine distance. So cosine distance in VV8 is just a normalization of the vector and then uh, doing a dot product uh, calculation, which is the same thing as cosine distance, but it's a bit faster if you only have to normalize once. Um, yeah, and this is uh, there. We have an optimization now for um, for AVX2 compatible CPUs, which doesn't work by default in Go. So we had to write it in assembly, which then you can integrate in Go. Uh, which is, I think, this was the major difference uh, than if you compared uh, a library like HNSW lib, which is like the, the reference implementation is the implementation um, that that came along with the paper. And that, that's written in C++. If you compared that to VV8 before or to VV8's HNSW implementation, uh, while we were just 
not using these uh, hardware acceleration, not, not these using these uh, AVX2 instructions. And that's where we, we lost a lot of uh, speed. So basically we have completed that and this was released um, with all the other uh, performance improvements in v1.4. So if you look at the, the roadmap, uh, oh, sorry, not at the roadmap, at this uh, graphic of, of the benchmark, uh, 1.2 uh, was basically, yeah, that was the, the control or sort of the base before we started optimizing anything. Um, and it's it, the time was so high that you can't even see it in this graphic anymore. It moved off the, the top of the screen. And then in 1.3, we took care of a couple of performance fixes. And then 1.4, I'm using 1.41 here because it was the latest 1.4 version, uh, but that the, the uh, uh, fixes themselves or the optimizations were introduced in 1.4 uh, alongside with the uh, image to vec module, by the way. So if you want to use, um, if you want to vectorize images out of the box that has been possible since 1.4, um, yeah, and there you see the, the major drop off from, from 1.3, which doesn't fit on the screen anymore, to, to 1.4. So basically, these changes uh, were step one on the roadmap. But as you can see, uh, there is something else on the horizon. And um, yeah, and that's basically the next step. So let me get into that. So when you sort of design a database, completely from scratch, or when you plan out a database, you have to make a couple decisions. You have to make a lot of decisions, but one decision that you definitely have to make is like, is my database gonna be read preferring or is it write preferring? And this, this has a lot of impact. And essentially, by the time we decided to build VV8, um, HNSW just came out or, or was just, just sort of just gained, I think it's been out for longer, but it just gained popularity in the community. And people were using it, and we were basically thinking, that's a really cool start. We need to build a product around this. Like, we need to build a whole database around it. So sort of this focus on these fast query performances that you could get with HNSW was pretty clear for us. Like, OK, that's that's the the sort of uh, benefit of a vector search that we need to, to offer. Like, it needs to be fast at query time. So basically, when we started out, we were saying, OK, that's the, the first goal that we need to achieve. It needs to be fast to, to read. Um, but turns out that if you if you do these things that we do with VB8, which also means that if you also store the object and if you also um, uh, build up this inverted index, and if you're generally in a space where there is a lot of data, it turns out that you also write a lot of data and that this can easily become the, the bottleneck. So basically, what good is the fastest reading database if importing data or if ingesting data into that database takes so long that you can never get to a very large use case that the, the database could basically easily handle from a from a, a read perspective, but you just can never get there because it's it's or I don't know because you you in uh, you create more data maybe that your your database can ingest for example, and um, that's basically the point where we said okay now that we fixed some of the performance issues that were going on in the vector index that we're that we're building now the actual bottleneck is just storing the objects itself so now we need to address this and this has been a a, a pretty big change so this uh, it just uh, merged the the uh, pull request that had, I think it was exactly 100 commits, then it had, had to fix something else, and then it was 101. But so sort of just to put this into perspective, this is like a major change that's been been happening in VV8. And essentially, we went from um, from etcd's bbolt, which is a fork of the, I don't know who it's by, the original bolt, which is a, um, yeah, a, a, a key value store that's written in Go that um, uses a B plus tree approach. So essentially sort of a, a very common pattern uh, uh, that you have for, for yeah, disk access or for, for data access on disk that works pretty well. Uh, this data, data store, this key value store also uh, supports transactions, which is something we haven't actually needed at all in, in VV8 so far. Um, and then we made the decision, okay, we need something now that works better on, on writing. We write a lot of data. We need something that's not the, the bottleneck there. And this is why we went with an LSM tree approach. And essentially, an LSM tree approach is actually it's actually quite simple, but at the same time, it's also, also kind of genius. It's also in use by a lot of databases. Basically, all the databases that you, you know um, that are really good at ingesting a lot of data in, in very little time, they probably use either an LSM tree directly or something similar to, to an LSM tree. And the idea is in an LSM tree that basically you start out with an in-memory structure. So you 
you import your data and just put it into a, a memory structure. And in this memory structure, the only thing that you do when you add something is you make sure that that structure itself is sorted. So whenever you have something sorted, it's, it's pretty easy to access it. Like, um, I don't know, if you have a, a sorted list, uh, then you can do a binary search, and that's pretty efficient to, to access it. So that's the only thing that needs to, needs to happen in, an, uh, yeah, in this memory store. It needs to be sorted. Uh, once this memory store grows too big, you simply write it to disk as is. You take this thing that's already sorted, write it to disk, one go. So if writing in one go on, onto uh, your disk is super fast. If, if you have an SSD disk, definitely, but even on a spinning disk, like just one seek, write, I don't know, 10 megabytes of data, pretty fast. Uh, the problem with an in-memory structure is that it's in-memory. <laughs> so you don't have the, the guarantee of having something on disk uh, if it's never been written. And if we're saying that the efficiency comes from the fact that you import into memory for, let's say, uh, I don't know, 15 seconds, then there's also 15 seconds of data that could potentially be be lost if if the database crashes. And I just said in the beginning, like VB8 is uh, the, the tool that really wants to be the database. And that, um, yeah, we can't just say, OK, oh, well, sorry, you lost the last 15 seconds of, of, um, of your, your data that you wrote. So we can fix that by writing into a write ahead log. And basically a write ahead log, or sometimes also called commit log, is another file that we write into that's also append only. So we only never seek in that file, but basically just start writing into and just write at the end of it. So basically this data that we ingest that was sorted in memory, we're also writing it into a file where it's not sorted, just sort of as a as a backup, basically, if something happens. And then if if nothing happens, we can just write the sorted part onto disk, create this kind of segment, and then start with a new segment. And the cool thing is that basically, even if you've just written hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data, when you start with a new segment, you basically start from scratch. You start with a new file. It's a new file that you're writing into. So essentially, this simply doesn't congest. It doesn't slow down. It has a, a sort of constant. Uh, write speed. And that is very important because that was exactly the, the issue that we had with the B plus tree before. And good read performance, uh, but when writing uh, at some point, it would just, uh, um, yeah, it was basically, it would basically um, uh, slow down. So if we look at the, the roadmap, that's what we're seeing. So in, in uh, from 1.4 to 1.5, which is out now, by the way, as a release candidate, you can, you can start using it. Um, by the time we we this this goes from the release candidate to the uh, the full release. Uh, there will probably be some smaller changes. We're going to add one or two features, but those are unrelated to the LSM tree. These are just things that we still want to get in the release um, that that we make. Um, but from the sort of performance aspect, you can start using this, and and it should work well. And if it doesn't, then please do tell us. That's why we have the the release candidate, so that we can make sure that if yeah if something goes wrong, um, that we can fix it. So this makes importing this data. Um, about 130% faster on, on, on this particular data set. Of course, these, these numbers are uh, very specific to one data set, um, but it's more about the sort of the, the relative comparison. Um, yeah, that made it 130% faster. And this is sort of only from writing the data. So the, the expensive thing that we're doing is basically, um, is basically uh, building the HNW index. Um, but as you could see, sort of because we're writing so much data, that was the bottleneck that we had to, to take away. Um, so something else that I, I want to say is um, right now, uh, I was talking about segments in an LSM tree. And basically, these segments, I'm not sure if I even said that, but these segments can also be merged over time. And then you basically combine a lot of small segments into a larger segment. And then you have sort of one sorted file, which is, again, a bit more efficient to, to, um, yeah, to, to use. If you've heard of, um, for example, the HNSW implementation in Open Distro, or if you've been following what's happening with Lucene, then you might not be saying, oh, segments, not, not good for a vector search engine. So let me, let me explain why. On the one hand, we have the vector index, which um, has a O of log n, or this is specific to HNSW, which has an O of log n uh, time complexity at query time. So essentially what that means is bigger is better. You want to have one large index. And um, with this sort of very primitive example calculation where I'm pretending that there's a 1,000 objects, well, if you have 
log of a thousand, which is three times one, then your cost is three. And if you were to now split this index in index into a hundred small parts that each just contain ten, then log of ten is one. But you have to do a hundred searches, so now your total cost is a hundred. So basically, it's a very very made up example with very made up numbers. Uh, but to illustrate that um, really on on this kind of vector index, it's much better to have one large one than than multiple uh, small ones. Um, in addition, when when you merge something, an H and W index, unfortunately, at least no one has really figured out how to do it <laughs> efficiently yet. You can't really combine multiple H and W indexes into um, into one big one. I mean, you can, of course, but is is as expensive as building them in the first place, or even slightly more expensive because like the the new index is now going to be bigger than the individual ones. So um, basically, for H and W, that's that's a problem. And what we want to do is we want to avoid that our vector index gets segmented. So this one, we really want to have one, one big one. Now, on the LSM tree, that's on the other side of the screen, it's exactly the opposite. Like we, we just show, uh, showed that basically um, these small sectors or these small segments are exactly what keeps that thing fresh and what keeps it fast at right speed. So here we do have those segments. And um, while we have those segments, uh, there's a, 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 such a thing called a, a bloom filter which is really cool too. It's a, a probabilistic um, sort of way of telling whether data is contained in a specific segment. And the cool thing about bloom filters is that it never has false negatives. It can have false positives. So it might be the case that it tells you, yes, the data is in there. And then you open this thing up and you look for it and it was a false alarm, data wasn't there, but it can never have false negatives. So you can never sort of miss data that way. Um, and, and this bloom filter can be sort of used to make looking up data in very many small segments, very efficient. Um, and, and, and then even sort of, yeah, over time, you can even merge those segments into, into smaller segments, uh, sorry, into fewer but larger segments. And then basically over time, uh, you have the same as if there were never any, any segments in the first place. And that's a relatively cheap process because as we said before, like each segment is basically just a sorted file. And if you take two sorted files and, uh, try to put them into sort of a next file, which is again sorted. That's basically like a, like a merge sort. So that's a, a relatively uh, cheap and, and easy uh, process. So on the LSM side, we're accepting the segmentation. We're saying this is, well, we're not just accepting it. We're really saying this is by design of, of uh, how an LSM tree works. And we say that we can also just improve it async. But if you look at the entire thing, sort of, and this is really what, what tells uh, the VV8 storage uh, apart from, for example, the problem that Lucene or Open Distro, um, which is based on Lucene, are currently seeing, is that we don't tie. So while this stuff lives closely together, and I'll get to that more when we talk about sharding, we never tie the vector index to a uh, uh, LSM tree segment. That, that's very important because then we don't run into these kind of issues that suddenly you have a lot of uh, yeah, segmented vector indices that you need to somehow either combine or accept that they're slower. So that was uh, step two on the roadmap. So the next step that we want to take is then um, sharding. So basically sharding or partitioning um, I'm going to explain what that is, and, and I'm going to start with a motivation of why we would even want to do this. Uh, once you've defined that you want to do this, uh, there are a couple of questions like, how do you do it? How do you partition? How do you, once you have those partitions, how do you distribute them among something, basically? Like, how do you assign ownership? How do you give someone ownership of a partition? And then once you've done all these, these things, um, yeah, what are the effects of those decisions? Like, there are probably trade-offs involved, and, and how does that affect real-life data? So the main motivation for partitioning data is basically we want to split something up and split it into smaller units that are basically the same as the larger unit, but just only contain parts of the data. So basically, instead of having one database, we would have sort of three smaller databases in a very, very simplistic way. And, and one of the motivations for this is basically um, that if you have those three shards, they since they're all self-contained, they don't have to live on a single server anymore. So you could, for example, put them on, on uh, multiple servers. Um, the advantages of something basically of, of partitioning your data or, or sharding your data is, uh, yeah, as I just said, you can spread it among 
sort of not even, it doesn't even have to be servers. It might also just be that you have a machine that has a lot of CPU cores and that you're noticing that, yeah, okay, I can, I don't know, use, utilize eight or maybe 16 cores efficiently, uh, but with 32 cores, I, I can't anymore. And then if someone, I don't know, for whatever reason, if you have a machine with uh, 128 cores, then it might make sense to just shard your, your workloads so that they can uh, use those more efficiently. But as we're sort of moving towards horizontal scalability, the main motivation is probably going to be that you want to distribute those uh, shards onto various servers. And it could potentially even be, I don't know, different data centers or something. So basically, as long as we decided that somehow we're partitioning the data, we can then move it into different places. However, it does not come without disadvantages. So the, the first question basically that you have, if you have, let's say you have 100 shards and you want to access uh, some, th some object with an ID, uh, John Doe 123. How do you know where that is? Like maybe there's rules somewhere, maybe you have to test something. I've also talked about plume filters before, so potentially this is something that, that could be used um, to, to sort of figure it out uh, where the data could be lying. Um, but essentially we need some sort of a rule. And um, the other thing is, well, right now in my example, I was looking for a key with ID uh, John Doe 123. But what if you don't know what you're looking for? <laughs> and we're a search engine. So basically, or VV8 is a search engine. Uh, so basically, we're dealing with a lot of cases where people don't know what they're looking for. So the, these are the kind of problems with partition data that need uh, to be solved. So for partitioning in general, I have this very, very simple example, um, which is just a modulo function. And we're using modulo 2. And there's this nice sort of stream of numbers. And some of them are, are already in buckets. And basically, what you can immediately see is like bucket zero contains the uh, even numbers, bucket one contains the odd numbers. So basically my, my hash function or my, my partitioning function is a simple modulo two, and then I'm just using the remainder. I'm gonna put it with the remainder is zero, I'm gonna put it into bucket zero. And if the remainder is one, I'm gonna put it into uh, bucket one. There is one advantage or one, one very big advantage on such a uh, distribution function. If I import something or if I'm looking for a key, I can just use that exact same function and uh, uh, sort of immediately determine where I have to look. So my stream here ends at 17. So let's say I'm looking for key 18. Don't know if it exists or not. But what I do know is that if I just use this key, the next one, and uh, apply the modulo function, since the remainder is going to be zero, I know that I have to look in bucket zero. And if it's not there, then, um, well, then it, it just doesn't exist. So this is this is one of the, the advantages. However, there is also a problem. And the problem is basically, well, what if I say now that instead of two buckets, I would want to have three buckets? So in this case, the, the easy thing to do would be, well, let's say, let's just turn this modulo two into modulo three. And all of a sudden, the values that can come out could be uh, zero, one, or two. But the problem is that you don't start from scratch. Like you might have already imported data. And now if we're looking at where the data goes, um, well, zero uh, modulo anything is always zero. So that's going to stay in the same bucket. Um, but as the numbers go up, so um, for, for one, for example, that, that also stays. Uh, but for two, so uh, two modulo three is now two. That's the new bucket. So two would have to be moved. Even though it was sort of somewhere, it, it needs to be moved. Um, if we go to three, that's in bucket one, so that was in a different bucket, but modulo three is now uh, zero. So this also needs to be moved into a bucket that even existed already. So basically what you're saying is if we have such a function and if we ever change how we partition it, basically we need to change the entire database. And that's a, that's a problem because especially if we have such a thing, that, that's a problem for any distributed database, but it's even more of a problem if we have something such an HNSW index, which is costly to, to build. So we need a, a solution for that problem. And before we get into that solution, just in general, a shard, as I said, is a self-contained sort of mini index. It's a self-contained unit. And um, for us, I said that we, we have sort of this motivation to keep stuff that belongs together very close. So if we have some sort of a function, we determine um, that something goes into shard two, then this shard contains everything. It contains the vector index, the object, the inverted index, basically everything is in, in that shard. And all of these shards together form the index. So 
to the user, to the outside, if they send a query. And whether that query touches a single shard or all of the shards, uh, to the user, it will just feel like one index. Like they won't know whether this was certain, or maybe they will know because it's it's contained in the response. Um, but the response will be the same. It will be the same as if this was all one index, and they don't care if it came from from yeah from one shard or from multiple shards, and whether these were local shards or, or shards that were maybe on a different server. And so that's the general idea that once we have a shard and index, that um, yeah, basically an index is made up of those. Of, of basically what currently is an index. So these all have the, the same capabilities of an index. And then of course, uh, um, on a search, we need to combine them. But uh, on a vector search, for example, we have the, the distance, uh, which we translate to a certainty. And that's something that we can use to, to sort them. So now for that problem that we have um, about changing the amount of, of shards. Um, basically that we saw with the with the um, modular function. And here, this is something uh, that we're calling uh, VB8's virtual shards. And this is very, very much inspired by Cassandra's uh, virtual nodes. So the difference between Cassandra and, and VB8 is Cassandra is not a search engine. So it doesn't need sort of an index sp spanning multiple data points, which we do. So we need something such as, such as shards, but we can still take some of the concepts that they do uh, that basically help us find a sort of smart way of how to distribute data in the shard. So what I have here in this, this ring fashion is basically another hashing function that, that I just made up that doesn't exist that produces values between 0 and uh, 11,999. Uh, the idea why, why this odd numbers is basically because it's a ring. And um, if we were to pretend this is a, a clock face, then we would immediately know sort of where the, the three is and where the six is. And then I just, because I thought like only 12 numbers, so that's a very bad hash function. So I'm going to make it 12,000. So knowing this, we can introduce something that we could co would call a virtual shard. And as of now, this doesn't change anything about sort of what we do. We don't now go out and produce, I don't know, 100 shards. Because as we learned in the, in the part about uh, HNSW, we want as few large HNSW uh, index parts as we can. So we can't just sort of make these virtual uh, uh, shards, uh, or, or we can make those virtual shards uh, very small, but we can't make the actual shards very small. So these virtual shards are basically now sort of randomly distributed on this ring. And each shard owns one segment of this ring. And the segment is defined like the shard only has an upper limit. And it, it owns everything sort of from the previous virtual shards upper limit. So if we take as an example, the, the uh, sort of uh, green one around the, the 3000 mark here, that very roughly, uh, the, the previous one ends at like 2800 and the new one starts at 3200, something like that roughly. So why do we do all of this? Um, basically, the, the cool idea is now, if we were to introduce one new virtual node, so once we would add, uh, uh, sorry, one new virtual shard, if we were to add a new shard, then we'd probably add way, much more than one. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that we would uh, add one new shard, uh, um, virtual shard. And, and this virtual shard has the sort of upper limit of exactly 3,000. Then what you would see is that it would basically split this green one here in half. And why does that matter? This is sort of as we see um, how we distribute these virtual shards into actual shards. So a shard, as we said, we, we need to have relatively few shards because we want to have large indexes on there. Um, that means a shard needs to sort of own virtual shards, which essentially just tells us that if the sharding function tells us you would go into a virtual shard, I don't know, something, then we know basically from a lookup table, OK, this is the actual shard in this case, one. And just for the sake of simplicity, I've just decided that shards basically own a specific color. So shard one would own the color blue, shard two would own the color green, and, and we can go on. And then if for, for whatever reason, we introduce new uh, virtual shards, we can cut them in half. And basically now is sort of, now is the major benefit if we look at those buckets with the modular function, like even if we add, or even though we added new buckets, 
nothing has to be moved across buckets that already existed. Like, yes, if we sort of, if we go from two to three and we say we want to populate three, yes, three will have to take something away from one and will have to take something away from two. At some point there's an equilibrium and it will stop. But it can never be the case that we have to move something from one to two or from two to one. So basically a lot less movement has to happen if we ever change these, these things. And now you might be thinking sort of before I said, well, one of the problems of an HNSW index is that you can't really combine it or that you can't sort of merge one into two. So now if I'm talking about potentially changing the shards, won't we have that exact same problem? And, and yes, we do. Uh, but there's there's two things that uh, to keep in mind here. So first of all, this is a much more long-lived sort of process that is much more rare. If you import into a segment, you will import for a minute or import for a few minutes, and you will already have, I don't know, probably 10 segments or something like that. So that's a very, very common thing where this is a problem. Uh, changing the shards or changing the cluster. So most likely the reason why you would change the number of shards is because you've changed uh, the cluster size. That's a much rarer occurrence. And if it is, then it's also much more acceptable to maybe have a background process there to, to readjust. So this is, this is a pretty rare process where the cost of sort of rebuilding an index might be more acceptable. That's the one uh, reason to, to justify this. The other one is that HNSW is basically just the one index that we currently have in, H, uh, in, in VV8. But we don't know what the future will bring. Maybe there's a new index at some point where we say, uh, oh, wow, the, the cost to build this is just a tenth of that of HNSW, making these sort of rebalancing acts uh, much more feasible. So this is sort of a very core decision in, in the design. And we want to be prepared to sort of not be, not, not have the restriction of never being able to, to change shards. And there are some, some databases out there where basically you can only select the, the number of shards up front and then you can never change it. And we wanna sort of be more the Cassandra in this, in this case, where we can say, yes, um, we are prepared to, to scale dynamically and we are prepared to sort of do things that maybe you couldn't predict already uh, when you initially uh, set up your, your uh, cluster. So when you partition like that, so, so basically now we've talked about what happens or how you partition, um, but also another question is what do you partition by? So basically you need to take something to make that decision. And in, in two slides back on that, or three slides back on that modular function, we were just using numbers and numbers, well, I don't know, we could say that this was the ID or this was the only property, um, but basically you just need to make that decision of what do you use to partition? And what we have in our plans, and, and I'm saying sort of this is the, the first version because I think there's there's definitely potential to also extend that in the future. Uh, at first, what we wanna go by is just the object ID. So everything in VV8 needs to have, every object needs to have an ID. And um, using that ID, uh, yeah, we can sort of easily identify, or we can easily identify, that's the point of an ID, but we can access each object by an ID. And if the ID is also the partitioning key, we basically know that on each uh, on each access, we have the partitioning key with us. So for example, why do you want to access something by ID? So on a search, it doesn't matter so much because the search, we said that each shard is self-contained. So if we uh, sort of combine searches from different shards, then it doesn't matter so much because like the shard will already give us the whole object. So we just need to combine the search. Um, but there is a scenario where we need to de do those lookups by ID. And this is VV8's cross-reference feature. So since we can't control if a cross-reference ends up on the same node, uh, it could potentially be, but it could also not be the case. Uh, we need to sort of when we resolve the cross-reference, we need to quickly grab that data. And in this case, it's much, much more efficient if we know if we can do the partitioning calculation in front and if it will tell us, okay, this uh, particular ID lives in this virtual shard, which belongs to this actual shard, which as we'll get there in the next step, belongs to maybe this node. And that's much, much nicer. Uh, the disadvantage is that if you have fuzzy information, um, you will probably touch multiple shards, but that, that's okay also if we, if we look at replication in a second, uh, that will basically show that, um, yeah, that there are ways around this. Uh, one of the ways of how we could potentially improve this in the future 
is if we just give that decision of how to make the partitioning, if we just give that to you, the user, because only you really know what you're using VV8 for. And let me give you an example. So let's say um, we're, we're coming back here, and this is sort of how this all ties together. If we're coming back to VV8's feature of using a, um, a structured filter, then you could potentially make the key that you're filtering on or the property that you're filtering on, you could make that your partitioning key. So for example, a uh, made up example in e-commerce use case, and, and we're saying uh, we're partitioning by a field that is the average uh, shopping cart total. So I don't know, these are, these are past uh, shopping carts and um, the total uh, is, is what we're partitioning by. And we're not using now a hashing function such as Murmur3, uh, which, by the way, is also inspired by Cassandra. I think I didn't even didn't even mention that, but um, it works well there. So why not also use it in in our case? Um, and but but we're using more of a range function where we're saying like, if this is a low value, it goes into partition one. If it's a mid value, it goes into partition two. If it's high value, it goes into partition three. What's low, mid, high doesn't matter for now. So now, if we know that our queries will always set this kind of filter, we can basically triple the, the search capability of our search, uh, of, of, of our search engine. Because if we're saying now, give me the users that are similar to X, and that's the, the vector search part, that have a high average shopping cart total, which would be expressed in the where filter, such as, I don't know, where shopping cart total uh, equals more than whatever the, the threshold is for high, then potentially you could be in a situation where this entire query is served by a single partition. And that means that if your data is partitioned, let's say across 10 partitions, uh, which are on, uh, living on 10 nodes, then you could potentially sort of, uh, uh, yeah, sort of up your, your intake or up your, your throughput by 10, because each of those nodes can, can serve those queries individually. So in the partitioning strategy, there, there's a lot of potential in, in sort of really high usage cases. So I think it would be really cool if we could open this up in the future and just sort of let the user um, define how you want to partition. Uh, but for now, just to get started, um, we just want to go with the, the object ID so that we have something to sort of evenly distribute uh, the data. The major motivation of that um, is really clear than in the, in the next step. So, so by the way, step three is now under development. So step one and two is basically released, either as a full release or as a pre-release. Uh, step three is currently under development and therefore also uh, the next steps. So now, now that we have those shards, um, this is probably the part that we've been waiting for all the time in step three, like why do I have shards if I can't do anything with them? Now that we have them in step four, uh, we wanna distribute them across nodes. And uh, this will finally get us to the point where all of that load can be spread uh, across multiple nodes in a cluster. So for example, um, if you have a data set that you say like, yeah, with one VB8 node, it just, I don't know, it just, it's it's too large for for what we can um, yeah for 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 what it could handle or maybe it's not too large for what it could handle but maybe it's too large for for how fast we could import it so there the benefit really is that in this case you can now um, once we we are at step four you can distribute that among multiple nodes in your in your cluster and cluster being the the key word here like this is the first time that we can really talk about a VB8 cluster cluster of sort of, yeah, where we have horizontal scalability and, and also where we see that horizontal scalability itself does not necessarily mean high availability. So yes, at this point, the cluster is distributed, uh, but it's not necessarily fault tolerant yet, or at least not 100% because replication is still missing at this point. So if out of those three servers, one were to die, um, then we could still serve two thirds of the data set which is sort of, I don't know, like it's better than nothing, but it's, it's not what we want. Of course, we want to be able to serve the entire uh, data set, which is then what we will get in step five. So, so by the way, between step three and four, this is sort of, I only have one slide, only saying now we distribute this. <laughs> but once we implement this, uh, there is a lot more things that we need to do. There's all the stuff in the background. Like we need to make sure that a schema changes, for example, that they are fully consistent, whereas other stuff might not have the same consistency requirements. So basically this is large enough from an implementation perspective to give it its own uh, step on the roadmap. Even, um, yeah, if, if sort of, I talked a lot about step four and then very little about, uh, or sorry, I talked a lot about step three, but very little about step four. The next step then 
And I think this is this is really this is where it starts to get get really cool and really exciting. And the next thing is then once we have uh, replication, and the way that we want to do so. So replication in general just means, uh, as you can also see in this this graphic. So if you, if you compare it to the previous one, each node owned like one color, the color of a chart here. Uh, and then in the next step, each node now. So here we would have a replication factor of three. Each node now owns basically a copy of all three shards. So in this setup of just three nodes, two nodes could die, and you would still be able to serve the entire data set. Like maybe not at the same throughput because you're you're missing two machines, but you can still serve requests. And, and that's basically the, the major benefit of, of having replication. And this is also the point where we can say, okay, now it's highly available. Something can happen, uh, a server can go down, and we can still be able to serve the data set. And um, as always with these things, the, the replication factor is something that you can control. You could potentially go to, to some extreme measures where you have maybe 10 nodes and every node contains a copy of every shard. Then you would have a, a super highly available setup. Like at this point, it would probably be more um, more realistic that I don't know, you just have an outage of the entire data center, uh, then that all 10 nodes go down individually. So this is sort of the decisions that you can make. Basically what I'm saying is, we as, as developers in VV8 want to give you that kind of control and just sort of design the system and you can use it um, according to your, your budget requirements, according to your um, uh, SLAs, according to your, your av uh, availability requirements. Um, there is also, yeah, so, so I haven't talked about the fact yet that uh, the way that we're planning uh, the replication thing is completely leaderless. So basically this means that there is no sort of write-only nodes and read-only nodes, but all nodes or all shards that are contained on, on several nodes are completely equal in that case. And um, that means there, there, there's no bottlenecks, but there's also a potential for something uh, that we've tried so far, uh, like in the, in the very beginning, actually, we did an experiment with a, a distributed uh, server or building up an HNSW vector index in a distributed fashion. Um, which works surprisingly well, like it needs needs more experimentation. Uh, but there is a way of sort of spreading that cost out of building the index by spreading that out across multiple servers without then even ending up into multiple shards. So the idea is that you basically just have a single shard that is replicated across servers, but still that those servers share the cost of building the index. So this is a bit experimental, but I, I think there's a lot of lot of potential. But even, even without that, that idea, um, the, the benefit of replication, I think, is is uh, pretty clear, which is uh, basically high availability to single or, or node failures. Uh, with regards to consistency, uh, the plan is to just have this eventually consistent. As we're seeing, sort of all of our use cases tend to be in the either in the analytical space or in sort of um, yeah the, these typical search cases where you replicate your data from another data store. So very eventual consistency is absolutely fine. If we ever see that we need more than eventual consistency, uh, we could very easily, or not easily, but we could definitely, again, sort of copy from Cassandra or be inspired by Cassandra, uh, where they have a model of tunable consistency, um, where, where the idea is that you can sort of control the cost of writing data, where you could say, uh, I don't know, I, I, for example, write with a, a quorum of nodes, and then I also need to read for a quorum of nodes, but then it's consistent. Or you could say that, I don't know, it need a replication of at least X, Y, or C uh, for a ride. Uh, but for now, that's not really the plan. It's something that that sort of our architecture allows us to do if we see the need for it. But for now, based on the cases that we're seeing, um, we're not yeah spending any resources on this. Um, so uh, still in in um, in the idea of of uh, replication. Uh, as I said before, we really want to give you the control of how you set up your, your cluster. And I just came up with two uh, examples here. Uh, one is scenario one. Um, let's say that you have sort of a workload where you import your data. Maybe it's, I don't know, trained with a specific uh, model. And you know that you retrain this, I don't know, every 30 days. So basically, your typical workload is like import once and then you, you start querying, which is something that we sometimes see, but of course also you get this database and you can mutate it. So it's in, in no way a restriction. Uh, what you can do then is um, you could say, okay, um, I want to have one shard per node at import time, uh, import my data set. And then once the import is done, I want to turn up my replication so that let's say we have three nodes. 
that we end up with the picture on the right here where each node is able to handle um, an entire request based on data that it has locally. Uh, and, and the benefit of that, besides high availability, is that you have this, this massive throughput at query time because each node can serve a search query across all shards um, in, in isolation without needing a network request and without talking to, to other nodes. Uh, scenario two is something differently where you would say, okay, we have a lot of writes and we have a lot of reads happening simultaneously and there's not an import phase and a query phase. And in this case, you could just say, okay, I want this highly available from the beginning or I want replication from the beginning. And then you'd have something uh, that is highly available at any time. So basically, um, as soon as you, yeah, your cluster is live, it will be highly available. Whereas in the first one, it's a bit cheaper to build and a bit faster maybe, um, but then only it becomes highly available once you, you start turning on the replication. The uh, final step on the roadmap is then dynamic scaling. So this is sort of the, the holy grail, or maybe the holy grail is, is multi-data center, which is also something that, that is possible with this architecture in general. Um, but sort of the next part here is, is dynamic scaling, where the idea is that uh, you can change the cluster size based on the demand that you're seeing at runtime. And this is also where we sort of come back, where we then see the, the benefit of, of, of this uh, ring thingy here with the virtual uh, shards, that if you dynamically change your cluster and you can't predict how you're going to change it, uh, that you might also have these these sort of um, these situations where you need to rebalance and potentially sort of combine shards or, or split shards up. And this is then where the, the virtual shards will help in sort of minimizing the movement because yes, sort of changing something about uh, an HMSW index and potentially other uh, vector index types in the future is expensive. But if we can at least minimize the, the changes that have to be done, and then that becomes a lot more efficient. And that's sort of the, the uh, yeah, final part on that uh, six step roadmap where we've seen that one and two um, are complete and released, three is in, in under development, and then the other steps are going to follow. So that is basically the overview. Uh, I've been talking for, for quite some time. Let me know if you have any questions. So that's uh, thanks, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot to process. So I'm curious to hear if, if there are any any questions yeah. also there as well. Yeah, exactly. That was also one of the the motivations <laughs> of saying we need to we need to record this because <laughs> there is a lot of a lot of stuff crammed into this. Oh, it, it was almost an hour. Wow. Yeah. But I see Gadu turn yeah. on his video, so I think we have a. a, a yeah. Question. Let, let me try to figure out how I can exit that view so that I can also see you. There we go. And I think I need to stop presenting. Yeah, so uh, so th this this was great. I think it, it, it gives us an idea of what can be done. I think we're still in experimentation mode. So uh, some of the some of the practical considerations uh, that we're having when we, when we're trying to implement use cases was so so the first one is OK, we, we didn't initially look at it as a data store, as the database, right? So persistent storage wasn't at the top of our mind, right? Like, you know, okay, and, and uh, it was more response times uh, for your uh, for your for your reads, right? Right? Like, you know, so the, so the write wasn't such a big uh, factor, but it was still a big problem if you're doing the one-off migration, <laughs> right? So I, I wanted to get my data from wherever my current persistent storage is into in, into VV8, right? And and that was a that was a big uh, that was a bottleneck, right? Like you know, the speed with which you could do that one-off migration, right? So we were looking at that uh, uh, alone, right? Like and and for me, right? Like you know, once I had done that, then the additional so and and then right like when i'm adding objects directly to the uh, to the VV8 instance, it, it's not a problem because it's not uh, you know. In future, right, like you know, sort of that load might increase, and then it might become a problem. But 
you don't you don't see that when we are uh, when we, when you're using it currently right so that's 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 one thing the second is the uh, the availability is one thing but also right like in you know, a recovery you know rp rpo right like you know sort of what happens if i lose some data <laughs> have i got back up how do i recover right like you know so if i'm using this as my database right so that one that was a that was a that was something at the back of a, of my mind to say right like you know to to prevent me from okay can i use it as a production database right so for me right like you know sort of okay my uh, you know um, what i had in mind was use something like cassandra or neo4j for my persistent storage uh, but you but you realize that right like you know that's not necessary <laughs> if you're using vv8 as the database right uh, so that's that's one thing and i think depending on the use case the characteristics will differ right like you know we can only we can probably like you know sort of experience that only when we try it and see what happens but that's when right like you know the, the we need that flexibility right do you need more sharding so ob obviously like you know i want uh, horizontal scalability but uh my uh, i i might just right like you know have a one off big migration load and then right like you know sort of my my ongoing right like you know sort of load for adding objects might not be that high right so i might need a different solution to to get my data on one time into into uh, you know, migrate it onto the vv8 instance and then ongoing that that won't be a problem so uh the the flexibility right like you know that that's coming will be will be great um and 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 of course right like you know sort of the um availability for both of those right like you know so sort of, and, and i think it's it it's for us to see right like how we can tweak it whether we want faster response times right or right like you know sort of is your if if you got very less load and you want to right like you know sort of con configure it pretty heavily for <laughs> faster response times that's that 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 uh, flexibility right like it will be great that's it sorry right like and i think i've taken too much of the time for no, questions no 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 not at all it's very cool to to hear sort of how how all this abstract stuff how this this ties into actual use cases and especially sort of two, two takeaways for me is, is is one sort of the um it might not be clear to everyone that VV8 really is a database and that that there might be something else that that you need or maybe yeah sort of in an experimental mode it might also make sense to to sort of start storing the data um or or to still have the data somewhere else or until you figure it out how you want to use vv8 and then you can I don't know, throw away instances and, and not not worry so much uh, but in the end sort of in that production scenario it's it's really cool that the, the data can be be safe uh, yeah. there and uh, the second one yeah uh, i'm sort of this this uh, import heavy load. This is also something that I've, I've thought about for cases where once we have the really dynamic scalability, you could produce a ridiculously large cluster and, and just sort of run it only for maybe a day. And okay. and like, let's say uh, if you have a machine that has uh, 30 times as much as, you, as the machine that you end up in the, in the end, but you run it for just one day, then it costs you basically one month of serving the data in production. And this kind of flexibility, I think this is going to be going to be a really cool. Yeah, I have a question about that as well, uh, Gadu. So, do I understand correctly that you're basically saying that your assumption was that you could use WVA just for the search functionality, but not as a persistent data store as well? Do I understand that correctly? Yeah. So I I wasn't, um, you know, I I wasn't seeing that. Um, you know, basically, like you know, the horizontal scalability that you get, and and the the flexibility of using distributed storage, right? Like you know, so so typically, like you know, sort of you, what the the way we do is we 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 try so we we plan separately for compute and storage, right? Like you know, sort of in any cloud deployments, and right, like you know, and that storage itself is a big cost that where where right, like you know, sort of there's a there's a whole uh, capacity management archival blah 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 right like you know sort of all of that and rpo objectives connected to that right the backup recovery all that connected to that uh, whereas right like you know availability is something different right like you know it's fine if i it's one thing if right like you know if i if if the 
uh, site goes down, right? Like, you know, sort of for some time and then it comes up, right? Like, you know, sort of it's, it's, it's fine. That might be okay from an SLA point of view, but if I lose data, if something gets corrupted, right? Like, you know, then my RPO, uh, so RTO and RPO are the two holy grails of <laughs> enterprise SLAs, right? So, and, and we treat each one of that differently. So I was fine with the, uh, RTO stuff and 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 it, it it was fine right like you know sort of the the, the kind of use cases that I'm I'm, I'm guessing um, might not right like to make a business impact if the site is down for a read for for a certain period of time right but if I'm going to use it as a persistent storage I don't want to get to <laughs> I want to make sure because this is my where my master data is stored right so which is why right like you know sort of till now in at least in the experimentation it was always okay i can i can spin up a cluster migrate the data right uh, check out the semantic search and do all that but then right like you know, i'm fine if that goes down i import it again right or and and for now right like you know, once i import it uh, the import is pretty painful just now because of the of the time and because of the amount of data for the one time import but once it's on the VV8 instance, then it is just right, like you know, sort of those one-off objects that I add, right? So typically, like you know, sort of I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll set up some messaging system, some event-based something that right, like you know, that says, okay, fine, yeah, every time a user gets added, just go and put it into right, like you know, sort of in, 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 uh, you know, uh, create that object there. So that's not a big problem till, and we've not faced that load yet. But that becomes a problem, but that's not a big problem just now, right? But if I am to say, right, like I'll, I'll, I'll need to trust VV8 with my production data, and that's the data store, and all my backup recovery RPO or, uh, or will be tied into that, then that, you know, it's so whatever you presented today gives that confidence, but it wasn't there before. <laughs> nice, nice. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was definitely one of the goals to just sort of convey that we're, we're taking these kind of things uh, very, very seriously. Yeah. And, and of course, um, something that that uh, a decision that I can't make for for people that use VV8 is always like, do you use VV8 as your only database, or is there a case where you have something like we're, we're not saying that just because VV8 is a database that you should never use another database. So really, it really needs to fit the the use case. So, for exactly. example, I don't know if you have a uh, very transactional data, then it it probably makes more sense if you have a transactional data store and then replicate into VV8, it's sort of very similar as you would today maybe see in, in sort of a, a hybrid setup of a Cassandra and then uh, using maybe an Elasticsearch or something. So that's also very much possible with, with VV8 and something that just needs to be done uh, decided on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Correct, yeah, yeah. I, th I think, yeah, makes sense. And and I'd probably like, you know, sort of in that case, we just need to think of, right, like, you know, sort of how we replicate and, you know, if I've, built my knowledge graph for my enterprise on VV8. And I, I don't want to lose and, and it's the Absolutely. same amount yeah, of data yeah. somewhere else, then yeah. Yeah. And and of course also backups play play a role. Sort of besides the, the sort of live replication, you can also just do do sort of old school backups. Old school basically. backups, exactly. Uh, which we've uh, by the way just implemented in the uh in the WCS, so in the VV8 cloud service, if you use the, the hosted uh, uh VV8 service. Okay. Uh, I think from the standard tier on, uh everything there there are just sort of snapshots that are that are currently replaced, and then you can restore snapshots. And it, it, it's a sort of very simple backup system for now. Um, the idea is that in the future, we could have incremental backups and all that, that kind of stuff. Um, but just in general, it's also a nice proof of concept of just having, yeah, how, how do you do backups with, with VV8? And, and of course, not just how do you backups, but how good is the backup if you never train the restore process, uh, but sort of do the, the whole the whole end-to-end -end thing, um, yeah, which we, we have there as well. And I think our documentation, is maybe not up to speed yet with regards to to what to do on, on backups and, on and backups, on restores, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's a, a good point, and we'll definitely also look into that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for for your feedback. It was really really cool. Also, it's 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 always so cool to just get that kind of connection, just see VV8 being used, and and see what the pain points are, see what the 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 cool things are, and and just I don't know, just in general to hear. That VV8, of, of course, it's being used, but I don't know, like to put a face to to a user is, is very very cool. So thank you very much for for sharing as well. Cool.
Thank you. I think it's like because we went like uh, almost 10, uh, 10 minutes yeah. over. So um, there's a, a few more things, Etienne, maybe nice to mention, because I think you haven't mentioned any uh, expected or estimated timelines, have you? Just just ballpark timelines. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I thought I thought I could get away with it. Yeah, that's right. No, so we so we do have a a, a sort of um, one date on a timeline uh, that that I think that's also on the website uh, where we said the the end of Q three. So basically, by the end of September, um, is where we sort of yeah aim for for this this timeline, which definitely means. Um, yeah, it needs to be horizontally scalable, and I'm pretty sure it also it, it will also have replication in it. Um, I don't know if dynamic scaling might be in that, so so maybe not. But it's sort of the, the the target point that we really say like is by the end of September we want to be at the I think it was step five out of six where where uh, replication is in, and then um, see where it goes. Maybe also on, on dynamic scaling. Yeah. So this is pretty pretty soon. Uh, already, which uh, I like from a from a uh, feature perspective, <laughs> which every time I, I check the calendar, I think from an implementation perspective, wow, where's the time gone? But I mean, we're we're not starting from scratch. We're we've already just released step two of that six step pipeline. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much, and also got to thank you for your question. Um, I think we're we're gonna wrap up, and so uh, we'll uh, publish this also on uh, on on YouTube because. Uh, we also had on our Slack channel, etc., and on Twitter, people asking for this, so uh, they can uh, they have enough material. Instead of watching a movie, they can watch this and you don't have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> <deviate> the movie <laughs> part yeah. one, the architecture. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, and um, well, I hope to yeah, see you. Yeah, thanks all for one. for joining. Yeah. Also for those that that have already left. <laughs> the, there's a couple of people that, that left like right right at the, the one hour mark. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for using up all the time. And, and yeah, thanks for staying for those that stayed 10 minutes yeah. later. <laughs>